let's make everybody welcome as listening around the world. Sorry about that little imperfection. Wow, what a song service today. Thank you, band and praise team, for putting so much heart in it and so much practice. I am soaking wet with sweat already. So I want double pay today. I want double pay today. Luke chapter number 15, I want to begin reading in verse number 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said unto his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey to a far country. And there he wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began for the first time in his life to be in want. Look at verse number 13. Do you see that word riotous living there? That's why we call this story the prodigal son. The word riotous simply means to be wasteful. It means to overspend. It means to give no accountability. That's what the word prodigal means too. It means to be reckless and wasteful. So when you hear people preach from Luke 15 and say, I'm going to preach on the prodigal son, they're talking about the young man that was going about with riotous living. The word prodigal son is not found in the Bible, but surely the concept is. When you read this story, and there's many I could have read from to get my title, but I felt like this one would be of utmost familiarity. It's in verse number 12 that the son received what he thought he wanted. He said, give me the portions of good that falleth to me. Now there's a problem here. First of all, he wasn't the oldest son. When the father died, it was the older son that would get the inheritance and split it according to the will and the portions of the family. Second of all, this will was not to be distributed until after the death of the father. So basically, the dad did not have to give him anything. But in verse 12, he thought he wanted his portion. It was a well-gifted sum of money, I'm sure. But just two verses later in verse 14, he had already lost everything that he had. The Bible said he spent all, meaning that he was absolutely down to nothing. If young people don't get anything else out of this message, I want you to get this. Fleshly desires will always cause you to squander the blessings that God had in store for you. Now, we know that God is a forgiving God. We know that God is a second chance God. We know that God is a God of restitution. But when you walk away from God, there are some things you're going to lose and probably never get them back again. I thank God for the conclusion of this chapter. I'm glad that he got out of the hog pen and came running home to a compassionate father that put his arms around him and kissed him and had a party and welcomed him home. But there were some things he lost in that hog pen that he never did get back again. And I think those of the Baptist faith need to be very careful on the way we preach this, that we give it with great balance. It's almost like we expect people to get saved, go live like hell for 25 years, and then when you're done living like a dog and you think you're ready to die and get serious, you just come back to God, ask Him to forgive you, everything's gone, and you just walk right up where you picked off 25 years ago. The problem is, that's not in the Bible. You walk away from God knowing better, you're going to lose some things out there in that world that you are never going to get back again. Let me mention a few that this boy lost. Number one, the Bible's clear that he lost his innocence. The Bible said in verse number 30 that before he left home, evidently this young man must have been a virgin. This young man must have kept himself from vile women. Because the older brother said, yeah, told his father when the younger son returned, you want to have a party when he spent everything he had on nothing but harlots. We need to go back to preaching to our young people and you parents shouting when I preach to young people 
that you ought to stay out of the bed till you get married. Stay out of the bed till you get married. And next time he comes on and says, well, if you love me, you would let me. If he loved you, he would want to protect your innocence and he would never want to do anything that would ruin your reputation. Because once that innocence is gone, I don't care how much you cry, scream, pray, and repent, you don't get that back again. The second thing he lost he never got back was his inheritance. The Bible said in verse 17 that he was so hungry he was perishing with hunger. He didn't have any money, no funds for food, a place to sleep, or even for clothes on his back. There are some blessings that God initially has set up for you. But when you leave God knowing better to willfully do that which is against God, there are some things of inheritance that God has laid up for you that you are forfeiting and you will never get them back again. Now let me preach because some of you are looking at me pale. When the boy came back, they put a ring on his finger, they put a robe on his back, they put shoes on his feet, but it never says anywhere where the father ever gave him another dime because he blew it while he was in the hog pen. So yes, it's important to get saved young and it's important to stay right while you're young. You don't have to throw away the best years of your life and come back messed up, crippled up, filled with scars and regrets. Get saved while you're young and live for God all the days of your life. The third thing he lost that he never got back was his influence. In verse 28, the older son said, I ain't got no confidence in him. I remember the days when he used to stand up and say how much he loved you, Dad. I remember when he used to talk about how much he loved the father. But look at him now. He's been partying, smoking pot, laying drunk, come back tattooed up, all kinds of piercings in his body, been sleeping with a bunch of whores. Now he's dead broke and has nowhere to go, and he comes back again. I'm glad he came back, but he never had the influence that he would have had if he'd have never left the father's house in the first place. And some of you right now are throwing away your influence. Right now, your influence is going down the tube. And you might get right, but you are blowing an opportunity to have an established, consistent, strong testimony from those within and from those without. And you might as well say amen because you know I'm telling the truth. I have no respect for you anymore. You've lost your influence. Dr. Green said this to me many years ago. He's 91 now. I preached 31 revivals for Dr. Green. He said, Brother Kid, if there's one thing I would want you to tell every young person in America, it is simply this one statement. You may live it up, but you'll never live it down. You may live it up, but you will never live it down. Now, you cannot deny in my story that the boy got what he wanted. He said, Father, you give me what comes to me. And the father divided unto them and gave him his portion. That's what the Bible said. He gave him what he wanted. But you cannot deny that two verses later, when the Bible said he spent all, you cannot deny that what the father gave him, he lost. So with that thought in mind, with a great burden in my heart, I want to preach this morning on the subject. They got what they wanted, but they lost what they had. They got what they wanted, but they lost what they had. Some of you are going after some of the fame-filled hog pens of this world. And maybe God might let you get some of those. But you remember one thing while you're wallowing in that filth. You're losing some things that you'll never get back again. There is some ground that you can throw away that you will never recover, no matter how old you might live to be. There's so many Bible illustrations of my thought. They got what they wanted, but they lost what they had that I just had a few jump out at me and thought I'd share them with you in closing. What are you going to do in Genesis chapter 3? you got this guy named Adam and Eve. They're living in paradise. They're in perfect fellowship with God. He's walking with them in the cool of the day. Now, Adam had it made, brethren. Adam had an unusual blessing that I or you ever had the opportunity to have. Adam had a wife without a mother-in-law. That's why it was called paradise. 
I notice only men are clapping. I, you know, I get asked the stupidest questions. You, you can't believe what I get asked when I go to revivals. One guy asked me not long ago, did Adam have a belly button? Lord God, I don't know if he had a belly button. I, I wasn't there to see it. But every day in the evening, God walked with them and talked with them. They were in a state of innocence and would have lived forever in that condition, in the very fellowship of God. They would have never been old. They'd have never had a pain. They'd have never been on medicine. They'd have never been a hospital. They'd have never been a nursing home. They'd have never been a policeman. They'd have never been a cemetery had Adam and Eve done what God told them to do. They'd have never been a broken home. They'd have never been a wayward kid. They'd never be drug abuse. They'd never be a drop of liquor. Think about that. There wouldn't be any illegitimate children in this country. There would be no suicide. There would be no murders. There would be no alarm systems. There would be no street lights. Adam absolutely had it made. But one day Eve approached him and said, Look, I've been talking to this snake. <laughs> My God, that ought to tell you something. <laughs> Freaking people talking to snakes, you need to see a psychiatrist in the first place, man. I'm afraid of five kinds of snakes, big ones, little ones, live ones, dead ones, and rubber ones. Those are the five kinds of snakes I'm afraid of. If you're looking for a snake handling church, you've got to head to the mountain. That ain't happening here. She said, I've been talking to this snake, and he told me about this fruit. And the Bible said that Eve looked at it, and she lusted after it. And she said she desired it, the Bible said, and it was one that would make her wise, make her as a God. That's what Satan told her. Don't you know when she reached out for whatever fruit that was? Don't you know God's Holy Ghost said, Eve, don't you do that. You don't know the price you're going to pay, Eve. I'd say to you, brother guy, had, if we could have stopped Eve in that garden and said, wait a minute, Eve, before you eat that fruit, I want to tell you something. Your older boy, Cain, is going to kill your younger son, Abel. Your family's going to be destroyed. You're going to be alienated from God. You're going to live in a world of sin that's cursed. You're going to have to die. And Eve kept looking at that fruit, and the Holy Ghost kept saying, don't do it, Eve. You know that's not right. You know what God said. And she said, yeah, but I want it. And brother, the the Bible said that she was deceived and she partook of the fruit and she gave it to her husband Adam and he partook of the fruit and they realized they were naked and they ran and they hid from God. There they are now, sowing fig leaves together down in a little gully and ditch. Tears are running down their eyes. Eve, could you tell me, was it worth the fruit? You, you got what you wanted, but you lost what you had. And the angel of God came down with a sword of fire and a cherubim drove them out of the garden and drove them out of the presence of God. Never again would Adam walk with God in the cool of the day. Oh yeah, they got what they wanted, honey, but they lost what they had. They got their fruit, but they lost their fellowship. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, if we sin willingly after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, refusing the knowledge of God's word and sinning on purpose carries a very high price tag. It'll affect your fellowship. Now you listen to me carefully. It is not a relationship problem. It is a fellowship problem. Nowhere did Adam and Eve ever have to get saved again after God slayed the animal and shed the blood and gave them skins, a type of a rebirth. They fell from innocence. They went into depravity and recovered to redemption, the death of something or somebody innocent, a type of Jesus. But he never walked with God again in the cool of the day. Even though his sins were covered by the blood and he was clothed in the lamb. God! God! Nothing, Adam. Oh, I'm glad I, I'm glad I got another chance. I'm glad you shed the blood. I'm glad I'm covered, but I, I want that fellowship like it used to be. That'll never happen, Adam. You know how many times in the seven years that I've been here that I've watched people get away from God and come screaming down this aisle as honest as you and I 
and fell on this altar and scream out loud, God, forgive me. You have prayed with them and so have I. And they don't last three weeks and they're right back out again. Is it the fact that they didn't mean it? None at all. Here's the problem. After they willfully sinned and went out and God dealt with them and chastised them, and if you're saved and you get out, God will either chastise you or kill you. And if you're not without either one of those, you've never been a child of God in the first place. So here's what happens. After they squander in the hog pen, they run to the altar, ask God to forgive them. And when they get up, Brother Corey, they want God to bless them, and they want that same level of fellowship and liberty and worship that they had before they left God. It'll never be like it was before you left God. Now thank God you can come back. Thank God there's forgiveness. But you are forfeiting a standing with God that you may never reach again. Oh yeah! They got what they wanted but they lost what they had. You can have your fruit but it'll cost you your fellowship. What are you going to do with Genesis chapter number 6 when Noah was building an ark? I was reading over in the New Testament, Mark and Matthew, yesterday. Here's what the Bible said in Noah's day. They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Isn't it amazing that God included marrying and giving in marriage in the wickedness of their day? I thought marriage was a good thing. Why was God saying that in Noah's day they were getting drunk laying around glutton, didn't want to work. They wanted to eat and party and let the government take care of them. And they were marrying and giving in marriage. Why would that be a negative thing linked with being drunk and being intoxicated? God was linking it to Noah's day, coming back to our day, because people did not take marriage as a commitment. If they got up one day and they felt like they didn't love each other anymore, they didn't work things out and pray about it and go to church, let their preacher talk to them, they just run down to the courthouse and for $49.99, they sign on the dotted line, run down there, get another little Jezebel that weighs 80 pounds, got more tattoos than you've ever thought of, got a ring in her snout. You know, you know, you know what gets me, you guys? I'm going to tell you how trashy some of you guys are. When you do cheat on your wife, you run around with these sluts with rings in their nose. My papa had women like that. I had stuff like that on the farm. It was a hog. I mean, I know what I'm talking about. Old hog. You put a ring in an old hog snout. <laughs> Dear God, you think if you'd be wicked and run around, you'd run around with somebody decent. Am I preaching now? So there's no commitment in marriage anymore. Now I'm going to be dealing with marriage the next two weeks because it's so infiltrated the churches. One out of every two marriages that are sitting here right now, you won't be married to that person the rest of your life. And God equated that to that day because they wanted the party. They wanted a free sex life. They wanted to live and let live. I'm going to tell you teenage girls, you may think sex is free till you get pregnant and that sucker don't want nothing to do with you and you're living on welfare and you're standing in soup lines and you're living on food stamps and you're in run-down apartments and you can't get a job and you can't go to college and you can't afford a car and you don't have a ring and you don't have a future. Oh, yeah. Come tell me about it being free sex then, baby. Maybe. And let me get on you whoremongers while I'm preaching on this. You dirty, rotten, little sunken chest, teenage hypocrite, you. If you're old enough to drop your drawers and knock a girl up, you ought to take care of that baby. You ought to pay for that baby. You ought to supply for that baby. You ought to be involved with that baby. You ought to be a daddy. Oh, yeah, you can have your party, but you're going to lose your protection. They could have got on that ark and been sheltered from all of that nonsense. They said, we don't want the protection of God. We don't want the provision of God. We'd rather have our party. You know, I wish I could tell you all of our teenagers are going to turn out right. Statistic tells us 70% of you will bite the dust after high school. Only three out of ten of you will even come to this church after you graduate. Seventy percent. You'll go the way of the world. You'll buck your mom and dad. Slip out of the windows at night. Secretly meet thuds at school that your parents warned you about. Get wrapped up with some Jezebel that'll get you away from God. Destroy your purity. And leave you hanging with nothing but disgrace and shame. 
we used to have a dog where I lived. I used to run every day on the road. I almost got hit, and I quit doing that. Some dumb woman on her cell phone liked to kill me. <laughs> so I work out at home now. But every day when I cut the corner, there's this little white house in the bend, and he had a little dog. And I promise you that sucker couldn't have weighed a pound. He couldn't have weighed a pound. But that was the loudest mouth dog I'd ever been around in my life. It looked like somebody picked up a rat, dipped it in super glue, and flung it across a barber shop floor. It had every color you could imagine. Every hair was in a different direction. Somebody kicked it right in the head when it was young. Its nose was mashed up between its eyeballs. Its eyes was budged out. They cut its tail off. It's the ugly. You had to be drunk to love something like that. You, that sucker could bark and it'd scare me to death. Because I'm not a dog fan anyway as such. And by the way, God never said nothing good about him either. But every day when I would run and I'd come around that corner, that dog, they had the screen door shut and locked. But the main door was open. That dog would see me and he'd back up all the way down that hallway. And when I would get right by that door, that sucker would come wide open. And I'm telling you, I knew he was going to do it. But it scared the devil out of me every day. And I'd run down the road and I'd think, man, I'd like to. <laughs> I said, it, it just, it, it, it'd be like a furry football, just bam! Just kick it one time. And that thing would hit that door every day. Every day it hit that door. Well, there were some stray dogs that would come around, you know, flirting around over in the yard and that. And that dog would just stand there and look out that window at them dogs. And I've often thought if I could take a microphone and go over there and interview that mutt, I'd say, sir, is there something you'd like to say? Yeah, there's something I'd like to say. I don't think my owner loves me. What do you mean you don't think he loves you? Well, look at all these boundaries he's put on me. I got to be over here at night to sleep. I can only lay over here during the day. Look at this door. It's closed. I'm not even allowed to go outside like the other dogs. Look at all the other dogs running free, running loose. They get to do everything they want, but no, no. I'm in a house where there's all kinds of restrictions and there's all kinds of boundaries and you can't go there and you can't do that and you're not going there and you're not running around with that. All I got is all these restrictions and I'll be honest, I hate them and if I had it, when I get grown, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. About four days later, I'm running past that house. Nothing. I turned around and I went, hey! Screen door was open, screen door was closed, big door open. I said, Ruff! <laughs> nothing. I went up to the front yard. I said, hey! Nothing. So I just took off running down the road, didn't think much of it, and I got down the road a little ways, and I looked, and there he was on the side of the road, run over I looked down at that dog and I thought, you know, <laughs> let me interview you now, dog. You got away from all the restrictions. You rebelled against all the boundaries. You ran away. You thought you knew more than mom and dad. You got all the answers. You're not going to be that. We just tell you stories like this to scare you. Let me interview you now, puppy. Oh, I wish I was back home. I didn't know how good I had it. I appreciate every boundary. You kids that's got a mom and dad that loves you enough to say you're not going there, you're not running with that crowd, you're not going to that party, you're not getting in that back seat, you're not laying on that dance floor, you're not sleeping in that motel, you're not laying drunk, you're not taking drugs, you're not fornicating, you ought to get up every day. You ought to get up every day and thank God that you got a mom and dad that'll put boundaries on you. Oh, yeah, they got what they wanted, but they lost what they had. Oh, I'm going to talk about Esau and his fantasy. It was Esau that was coming back, and Esau means to be rough. He was red-haired and double-jointed and crude. And Jacob was smooth-skinned and spoiled by his mama. And Esau was a hunter, 
and therefore his daddy loved him because he loved the venison. And Esau one day came in from hunting, and the Bible said he was faint. And he looked at Jacob and said, uh, give me a bowl of that pottage you got over there. He said, sure, if you'll give me your birthright. Birthright for a bowl of beans? When you think about that, that's nothing short of stupidity. Birthright meant Esau was the first to get all the inheritance of his dad. Esau meant he was the one to be blessed more than any other children. It was Esau. And he gave it all away for a bowl of beans. His lust to be satisfied immediately, he didn't realize that the expense that he was going to pay in the future. Because later on the Bible said he sought, he sought his birthright bitterly with repentance and tears and found no place for it. Oh yeah, you can throw your life away and get what you want now. I'm sure we've got some that have and we have some that's already done it and some of you probably will. But every day you're away from God, I want you to remember this preacher said to you, they got what they wanted, but they lost what they had. I want to talk about Judas. I want to talk about Judas, and I'm done. He got his coins, but he lost his chance. Matthew 24 said he longed to get the money for 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. No one telling how many endless nights he tossed in the night thinking, boy, if I could just get that money, I would be happy. The Bible said he was a thief and bared a bag and what was put therein. Let me tell you something about sin. I've been there. I've got the scars to prove it. Sin is like cotton candy. It's a little bit of sugar that's been blowed up to look pretty. But when you get it, there's nothing to it. What would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Outside of Jesus, everything you're living for will lose every bit of its value and worth when it comes time for you to face the grave. You can't get people to get time to get right with God anymore because they're too focused on making money. Everybody is filled with greed and the love of money is still the root of all evil. Luke chapter 12 and verse 20, the man that built the bigger barns, it was him that when he was in the days of productivity, that death tapped him on the shoulder and said, Thy fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Here's my closing statement today with a warning. You better start, stop living for what you want, and you better start living for what you need. Let's stand with our heads bowed. I feel conviction in this auditorium today, and that's a good thing. These are the days of Elijah, declare.